You're listening to Druidcast episode 206. my friends and welcome to Druidcast episode 206. I am your host Dave the Bard and Druidcast is brought to you on or around the 20th of the month by the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. If you want to find out more about membership to the Order and our courses you can do that at our website which is at druidry.org. Opening the show, you heard Outside of Time, a beautiful song by my guest this month, the singer, songwriter, opera singer and magician Nymphia, who will be on the road here in the UK during September. Now, she originally got in touch with me to help her with her UK tour, but as we spoke on Zoom, 
I quickly realised there was a person here with a story to tell. So I invited her back on Zoom for a proper interview for the show. We cover so much during the interview and it's a long one too and really deep and wonderful conversation. So grab that cuppa and enjoy this month's talky bit with Nymphia. The Talkie Bit. I am here with Valentina. Hello, how are you doing? Welcome. I am wonderful. Show. Yeah. Um, I've been looking around your website. We were contacted uh, by yourself uh, to help promote your UK tour, which we will talk about towards the end of the interview. Um, but while we were talking, I just thought, wow, this is an, a really interesting person. So I thought I want to get to to know you better and allow the Druidcast listeners to to get to know who Valentina is. Or is it is it Nymphia? Nymphia is that what would you prefer to be your? That's your your band name. Your yeah, that's my artist name. Kind of like Lady Gaga is her artist name. So that my is- artist name is Nymphia, and my personal name is Valentina. So you can call me whatever you would like. All right. Okay. Well, I'll I'll stick with Valentina for the moment, and then I'll swap just to confuse everybody. <laughs> and I have my magical name too, but we won't talk about that yet. Oh no, we don't want to talk about that. That's that's yeah. between you and whoever that is. Yes. So uh, you know, you've had an amazing journey. Um, you you you've been in all almost all types of musical genre, as far as I can tell, from opera to pop. Um, also, you know, appearing as backing vocalist to John Cale, apparently, on on uh, the Jay Leno show. So yeah. so what I'd like to know is um, tell us a little bit about your musical journey and how you first got into music and those first little seeds. Absolutely. I wanted to be a singer, musician, songwriter since I was – five and i wrote my first song when i was six i found an accordion in the attic of my family house and i dragged it downstairs this old honer accordion and sat down and wrote a country song called goodbye darling on that (laughs) and it wasn't a very good song but that was my when i was like this is what i want to do and i remember being a child and seeing people on television singing and making music that's what i want to do so i've always wanted to do that and when i was very young i happened to walk by the television when they were doing like a rebroadcast of jefferson airplane doing white rabbit on the um some television show ed sullivan show i believe right and it literally stopped me in my tracks I was, you know, I remember walking by the television and just, what is that? And I was, I have goosebumps right now, just remembering it. I was so drawn in to that brilliant song and just the vibe and the energy of what they were expressing there. And ever since that moment, that's what I really wanted to do. And that's actually why I ended moving to, to San Francisco. Right. I mean, it sounds crazy, but I wanted to get some of that energy of the San Francisco sound and the whole cultural movement that happened before my time. You know, I was way late for, to the game, but uh, it impacted me that much. And then I started taking guitar lessons and in, in when I was about 15, 16, um, I played in bands. You know, the, the the classic route, you play cover songs. I did a lot of Crosby, Stills and Nash, a lot of Joni Mitchell, because I really liked that sort of stuff for acoustic guitar playing. And then in college, I started playing electric and started getting into electric uh, band covers. The Pretenders was um, someone, a band that I loved, really related to Chrissy Hind also. Mm-hmm. Um, the Police, we did a lot of 80s covers. And I also, at that time, discovered Kate Bush, who ended up being probably my most formative influence of all the influences I've had, which includes opera, because along this path, right after I graduated from my first degree, which was mechanical engineering, which is completely ridiculous, (laughs) but I had this master plan, I know I'll make lots of money and uh, be a musician on the side, and that was completely not the way to live your life. I Mm -hmm. learned very early on. So I fled to the West Coast 
um, and went back to music school and started studying opera and then became an opera singer too. So there's that woven in through this whole path. And the reason why I did that is because it I could understand how you could get gigs. I still couldn't figure out how do you become recognized in the world of music? You're playing in a bar somewhere. Does you hope that someone comes and discovers you? I couldn't wrap my head around it. Whereas with opera, I could, oh, they're doing a production of Carmen. They need a Carmen. I will go sing for them. They'll like me or not. They'll hire me or not. There was a very linear path. And mm. that made lots of sense to me. And, and the music is extraordinary. Yeah. So that ended up being a detour. And then finally, after all that was said and done, and I made, I had debuts at San Francisco Opera, New York City Opera. I sang with the symphony. I sang at regional houses. It was you know, wonderful and very fulfilling. Um, technology caught up where I could make recordings at home. I didn't need to hire an expensive studio. And so when that happened is when I also, at the same time, felt like I had completed with opera. I had done the roles I wanted to do. And going way back full circle to when I was five years old and six years old and writing that first song, I want to be the singer songwriter I've always wanted to be. And so that's how Nymphia was born. All right. And that's where you're at now. I, I, I want to go back to that six year old, um, finding that accordion and writing your first song. Um, I remember that moment on my guitar. I was 11 when I wrote my, so you, you got a head start on me. Um, and I'd had a few years of guitar lessons, but my guitar teacher couldn't read music. So he taught me by ear. Damn. So, so you, finding an accordion you couldn't have had any musical teaching at, at age six but so did you find the sound you know music is just a sound at the end of the day it's yeah. an inc incredibly magical sound but it is just sounds did you find that you just knew like the idea of a g a c and a d that's what you need to create a song or whatever you know the triad of chords and all those things you know that's an excellent question uh especially musically i love that the reason why the song wasn't very good is I, I found, you know, the C um, key, which is all the white notes, right? So it's, and they all sound, they made sense to my ear. So I just played C, D, E, F, G, and it was goodbye, darling, goodbye. It was very low like that. Mm -hmm. I will miss you so. And I just kept moving up the keys on my fingers and following them and what, and it made sense. So I literally just, picked it up and just started playing and singing along to wherever my hand fell and what made sense to what I was hearing that matched the outside world. So it was very intuitive, really. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know it was one going to four and then five and then one. I didn't know that. I just did it intuitively. And then later, obviously, you learn these other parts, which makes it even more fun when you know what you're doing, right? Yeah, was it a musical household you you grew up in? No, it really wasn't. They were all engineers and scientists, right? Teachers. That's my yeah, engineers, scientists, and teachers. So, uh, there. My cousin is a musician, but that's no one really was. So, uh, right. you know. And so, Grace Slick. I mean, what a voice! Unbelievable. Right? You know, your first yeah. encounter with. Uh, with White Rabbit there. I mean, it's just such a powerful song and the way it builds and everything. And I've noticed you've got Grace Slick, you've got Chrissy Hine, you've got Kate Bush, three incredible female musicians um, yes. who I, I can completely get why they were a massive influence on, on yourself. Um, but but before you heard that White Rabbit, was that what, what age were you when you heard Grace Day? I can't remember what you said. I, I didn't really say the age. I think I was at a slumber party at a friend's house. So I think I was probably around 10 or 11. Right. Okay. So starting to wake up a little, you know, heading into puberty and waking up into the themes that that song is referring to, you know, moving out of childhood. Yeah. 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 I remember when I was at school, my teachers were very concerned about me. Not, not, <laughs> they were saying, come on, Dave, you've got, a, you're not stupid. You've got a lot of intelligence. You need to work harder. And I would just say to them, don't worry, I'm going to be a professional musician. And I'd already got it in my head when I was at school that that was just going to be it. I mean, it, it's, it took me till 2008 
to finally do it but it, you know so <laughs> Did you have that? I love that. You know why? Because when I was in engineering school, I, first of all, at that time, there was like one out of 10 people was a female in engineering school. It's, I'm sure it's very different now. But um, I would say to people, well, I'm not going to be an engineer anyway. I'm going to be a musician. Right. And they all would say, why are you in engineering school? <laughs> I understand why they're their confusion. So, yes, it's the same, same thing. <laughs> Same kind of thing, isn't it? It's a hard road, though, as you know. Yes. It's, I, I, you know, I talk a lot with other artists about this. I feel one of the hardest things for any artist is to decide and figure out how am I going to move through the world and be an artist, not be starving, mm. live a comfortable life, a good life, and keep my art alive without selling my soul too much. It's, I think, extremely challenging. Yeah, so yeah. I understand people used to say, too, I always hated this. They would say, if you could do anything other than be a musician, do it, because it's so hard. Yeah. And I understand what they're saying. I hated it when they said it, but yeah. I do understand what they're saying. And when are you going to get a proper job? That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so music was growing in your life, and I, you, you've gone through this 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 half this journey through the different genres through the things that you love dear but your music now is very very rooted in spirituality is, is very very rooted in that so there must have been another journey going on at the same time um, yeah. that, that that maybe may have been separate for a while i don't know maybe we'll explore that but uh, but they've come together now with nymphia but but what what, what about your your uh, your interest in things spiritual how did that all come about you know, I think I've always been that way. Again, my parents told me that when I was little, like five years old, that I would come in and say what they would say, my dad would say nutty or uncanny things. Mm. He said that there's no way you should have known these things about other people. In other words, psychic things. And they are not the, they're very rationalist materialists. Um, so it's not something that they were like, into the woo woo world but they would tell me that i was doing these things that they didn't quite understand so i think i've always been this way and then as you get older it develops when i, I remember being 16 and having um sp incredibly spiritual experience so once you have that experience and i've had other experiences you start understanding that there is an other world and I am so interested in that other world because why not? I want to know the mystery. The mystery is what inspires me. I want to know about the nature of reality. And so I would say I dabbled in spirituality, but when I really dived full in, full in was when my fiance, Keith Keller, died. And that was in 2006. Mm -hmm. And it was unexpected and yet the day before he died i saw it i knew it was going to happen but i didn't quite fully want to register it and when that happened it i be i said okay i need to find out more about all of this what is this why am i having these inklings of things uh even before that happened i would have I have what I call my voice. It's a very soft, warm, gentle voice. It seems like it emanates from my right side, which makes sense. I feel like it comes over my right ear and it will say things to me. And every time it does, I'm not kidding you, it turns out to be true. Hmm. Little things like, I'm, why are you moving, your, realigning your bookshelf when you have to move? And then like three days later, my landlord called and said, well, we have to, you are going to have to move. That was years ago. Little things like that uh, all added up to there's something here and I need to find out more. Mm. So I, I did it in multiple ways. Um, I'm a third degree uh, Celtic traditionalist um, witch, um, which I work with a very small group and have been working with them for about 20 years. That we are a very eclectic magical group, which I love. So we have uh, we've worked with Dolores Ashcroft Nowicki, if you know who she is. I had 
adore her. <laughs> um, when I got to meet her in person, I was just thrilled because I'd been reading her books and studying some of her work. And then she came over and um, with our group and we did a whole weekend with her. So in, in that group, as I'm saying, we're eclectic. We do, we did a whole year and a half on the Hebrew letters. We've done um, fairy work of Orion Foxwood, which I think, have you, do you know who he is? <laughs> oh, 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 you're going to be so excited to dive into his work. He does, um, he's an American uh, and it's a lot of root conjure works and Southern root conjure fairy work. But he ha he has a couple of books that, you just work through those books and you uh -huh. are getting initiation on this whole other level of into fairy i highly recommend his work we've done work around that we've done our own work we're, we're creating our own oracle deck on time and we've created our own um place we have a contacted place that we go into the other world to do work and meeting meeting with some of the various intelligences so I've done that whole realm. And then I've also done when Keith died, I really desperately needed healing because I was in a very, very bad way. I was wanting to literally wanting to die myself. Mm -hmm. And so I went to a local academy called the Academy of Intuition Medicine. And I studied there for two or three years. And then I became a tutor there as well and worked on the students. And that path was so profoundly healing for me. Uh, I was I was also having contact with Keith from the other side. So just being able to sort through all of this. And basically the training of magical work, as you know, is training your mind so that you can understand the information that you're receiving and how to even integrate it and work it into your your physical body and into your life and how to build relationships with the other world um and that's the whole point of training your mind i was just seeing something yesterday that you know some of these things come so quickly that if your mind isn't trained you'll miss them and as you know as humans we all have this capability harper feist talks about we wouldn't have evolved with this capability if it didn't serve us in some way and it's ancient and it's often repressed because of the modern world that we live in and that's why just like art i see art and spirituality so so similar because there are these delicate little buds that you need to carefully tend so that they can grow and that you know they don't get trampled by materialism or linear linear thinking or all this stuff that we're doing in the physical world mm. and they both and the thing about art and why they end up coming together for me is um that place of inspiration where you are drawing down something from nothing is a very spiritual place and in some ways i feel like they're almost identical when you're in that state and then it's what do you do with it oh i'm going to create a piece of music oh i'm going to do a ritual to freya you know it you can do with that state as you wish mm -hmm. and so my latest album and book what have i forgotten because i've been doing all this magical work over the years the thing about it's called the great work right um the western mystery tradition the thing about it is it you can't help but seep out of who you are mm. and i love to see that too when i look back at who i was 20 years ago and who i am now and and how much i've evolved and grown through magic and life of course mm. but it can't I feel like you can't help but have that just seep out of you as an artist. And those are the things that inspire me the most is what what are these worlds? I have a song called Liminal, which is all about that liminal state between the worlds. And so I started writing these songs for my latest album. And before I would sit down to write, I would always do a ritual here in the studio with just some incense to just call in my muses to get into the place of creation and connection. And in doing that, I think what ended up happening is every single song I wrote had an occult or an esoteric message to it. Mm -hmm. And so then as I was sequencing the music to, for the album and I was laying them out and trying them out in different orders and things like that, 
that's when I saw, oh my God, they're in the order of spiritual alchemy when I finally laid it all out. Oh my God, there's so much here that I need to explain. And then that was the genesis of the book that comes with the album, yeah. What Have I Forgotten? So it's all time. intertwined, right? It's like this yeah. jungle, yeah. this jungle of growth and all these wonderful living things in it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've spoken to many people over the years whose spirituality kind of began with a trauma of some description. Yes. Yes. Um, an opening up, a kind of questioning of what's all this about if this can happen so suddenly you know that kind of thing of, of sounding like what happened to yourself and with with keith there and um and that's that's a strong tradition in shamanic traditions as well you know that, yes. that people can come through very very strong illnesses or something like that and then when they come out the other side they have a deeper understanding of this potentially this thing they've always had all their lives but suddenly it, it's something that they can they can touch, they can see, and they can feel in a much deeper way. And um, I've I've always felt that we are we are storytelling species. You know, we we live we we live our lives through story, and and I think that's part of the reason why Netflix is so popular and places like that because we still need story. You know, yes. If yes. you take away Netflix and all those other things and those stories, then our ancestors, the storytellers the bards the schools the shops would have been the the people who came to the, the 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 village the town and it would have been the only time that you would have ever been able to hear a musical in music being played by a human being because obviously mm -hmm. in those days believe it or not um spotify didn't exist yeah <laughs> i know absolutely netflix has replaced the fire the campfire the campfire yeah. gathering. yes yeah, absolutely yeah. But I think what you're keying on to there is like, you know, in, in the Druid tradition, you'd call it the Awen, you know, this yes. kind of flowing spirit that is all around. And it's, uh, it, you know, it's it's given story by that that tale of Keridwen brewing her cauldron and the three drops coming onto the, the thumb of Gwion Bach that then becomes Taliesin. And then mm -hmm. in the Norse tradition, you have the Mead of Poetry as well, which is the same thing to me. It's, it's that flowing spirit of inspiration. And, you know, it, it sounds to me like, you know, when you do your ritual or your little meditation or whatever it is to connect with that, with that energy, maybe mm -hmm. that's what then comes through in your music. Is that, would you say that was? Yes. True? Yeah. Yes. And I was so surprised at how much it came through because when I was doing this for this latest album, I really was doing it just to get me into the right state. And what I found fascinating is these these this occult and esoteric ancient Western mysteries ended up coming through the music too. Yeah. I love that so much. That's what's so incredible to me about humanity and us as beings, all the layers, you can't escape yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what I mean? That That who I am is seeping through. And I think that if you create a ritual then the magic is going to come through. Yeah. And it, versus if you are writing in a in a different state. Yeah. It, it's really about the state that we're in. And I think that's part of what I love about this endless study of magic and Western mystery is that you're becoming a master of state of and managing your state is the first place of managing your life and living a great life. I mean, that's really, to me, what magic is. Yes, it's about manifestation, but I think the most important part is how can you be living in a good state for your life? Yeah. And are you in control of that in a good way? Not repressing, but, you know, being able to to manage the ebb and flow and and be the magician on the on the tarot card. Sure. And 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 and. um congruence you know aspects of your life fitting in with other bits of your life you know that authentic mm -hmm. life is something that i think is you know always a constant quest for for people um so just before we started to talk you sent me the introduction to the to your book um what have i forgotten and which is the book that goes with your album um mm -hmm. 
the album doesn't seem to be on the old good old Spotify or Apple Music or anything like that. Is that a decision you've made to make it so that pe- it's a physical it, copy only, that kind of thing? You know, you're so brilliant. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> I have parts of the album on there, but yes, I I have a love hate relationship with Spotify as I think most musicians do. It's an excellent discovery engine. But as you, I'm probably, you've experienced this too on Spotify. You'll hear something you like, you'll save it on your list, but you don't really know who the artist is and you're not really engaging with them much. You know, oh yeah, I like that song, but you don't even know the name of it. And I like to create a very strong and close relationship with my fans and listeners and myself. So that is, yes, buying directly from the artist, the physical CDs or the downloads. And this album, particularly because it's very much of an immersion uh, from start to finish, you know, we start with what have I forgotten where you're looking at the scrying mirror Mm. and that's taking you into the inner worlds. And then you go on this journey all the way through the layers. Then you're in liminal. That's the next song. You're in the liminal state between the worlds. And then the next forgetting to remember is calcination where you're dropping, you're burning these parts of yourself off that you don't need, the first stage of spiritual alchemy. And that song is a really fun 7-4 indie rock song about, I had this vision of us dancing around a fire in this other world and we're all sprouting horns and hooves and we've just shed all of our pretenses and we're just being there in, in our pure primal selves. That's what the song is about. And, you know, then, so that's why it relates to calcination, which is dropping these pretenses that we don't need, right? So, yes. I was just going to say, that sounds like many a pagan campfire I've been around. Doesn't it, though? I know. (laughs) I know. Exactly. And I love, that's what I love about the pagans in general is, you know, they're they're seeking for this authenticity is is a good word. And interestingly, I was raised an atheist. So I didn't have Christian baggage when I became a pagan because I consider atheists and pagans are they're so close together. I'm I consider myself a pantheist versus an atheist. And if you you think of it like a grand circle and they're literally like right next door, you just tip over and there you are in pantheism. So um, that was a nice thing when I think thinking back on my spiritual evolution that I didn't have to wrestle with a lot of those problems and so that really kind of matched my atheist upbringing of uh, you know because there are definitely i would say within that there was th- this idea about some repression of religion mm. and religion and spirituality are two different things and i don't like to judge other people's religions you know because there's something i think we're all doing the same thing we just decide to do it it's just like i'm going to sing opera today or i'm going to do a blues song it's the same it's music. You're just doing it with it in a different genre. Is how I see it. Yeah, there are many mo- there are many paths up the mountain, as they say. Oh at, yeah, at the top of the mountain, you know. And one of the things I will I always say, Richard Dawkins, you know, that famous atheist who wrote. Yes. The, you know, if he said to me, "Okay, prove your gods exist," I'd just take him outside into the woods and say, "There they are." You know, it's like, yes. you know, it's 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 that very thing to me. You know, is that me too. That on a, on that deeper level yeah yeah amazing amazing what a journey and so it sounds like your album is a is a concept album in a way um and i one of the things i was told recently by a songwriter is that on spotify and this will back up what you've just said <laughs> on spotify they had an algorithm of people who skip tracks and it used to be that you had to get it was very much recommended that you got to the chorus within 45 seconds because that's how long people give new music on Spotify before they decide whether or not they Oh, are. I like that. Okay, 45 seconds. Yeah, well, okay. apparently I, I've heard that it's dropped to 30 seconds now. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so that means that any that songs like concept albums like um Shine On You Crazy Diamond, this show. Yes. Yeah. Shine on you, crazy diamond, or the dark side of the moon, and those which kind of very, have that very. They would they wouldn't even be made nowadays under the kind of Spotify guidelines, you know. Um, so you are correct. Yes. Yeah. Which, but I think I think it's up to us 
us music musicians to, to to say no we we dig our heels in and we say no we're gonna we are gonna continue to write songs which have meaning and and if you get past that 45 seconds you're gonna be a, you'll have a great time <laughs> yes yeah, there's a saying don't bore us get to the chorus <laughs> oh, there you go so, but yes, oh my gosh, Dave, thank you, because that is one of my manifestos in my music, and I can truly say that all of my listeners, that's what they love about my music. It's not that. Yeah. It's something else, and it does bring you to the other world in listening to it. I've heard it from many people, and it's not something that's overtly that, like like something that's ambient and you're putting you in a trance, however. It's just there's something infused in it, you know, like a good cocktail with an infusion of grapefruit or something like that, that you can sense it. And I think that's the intention, you know, you, whenever you're interfacing with art, you can sense the intention of the artist. And I feel the same way about the whole musical world at large. That's why I love the indie movement so much, because there's a lot of great, great music and great artists out there that do not have to fit a mold and therefore they can be, create the way they see fit their music. And now with the internet, you can reach out directly to people and have them discover you. So yeah. I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. And I've met a, a number of um, American musicians over the years. I've, I've played a few times at some American festivals, you know, SJ Tucker and winter and yes. Shannon. And it was just how I know you yes. who introduced us to each other, you know, mm -hmm. um, Arthur Hines, you know, there, there's, there's, and, and one of the things I love is that the, the, you're all friends, you know, you're all just on the path together and there doesn't seem to be any competition or anything like that. You just, you play together, you celebrate mm -hmm. together, write together. It's a, a really lovely community of American musicians out there playing at all these festivals. I saw you yeah. play at Hexenfest. Is that what I saw you played there? I played at Hexenfest last year. Yes, it was fantastic. And SJ Tucker was there, as a matter of fact. There you go. There you go. And of course, Sharon Knight and Winter played because it's their festival. Yeah. yeah. It was a beautiful, beautiful festival. For anyone who's near Saratoga Springs, California, it's coming up again this September. Right. I, I highly recommend it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about what have I forgotten? Um, because obviously, the mu did the mu the music came first, or did the book come from? Uh, did the book come from the music? You know, what the book came from the music when I realized, as I said, you know, I wrote the songs and I sequenced them, and I realized, oh my gosh, there's a lot that needs to be told that are which I love hidden messages. I love that about the mysteries and the occult, where they're working with symbols and multiple layers. And so my songs had that woven in because of all the work, the studies and the, the books I've read and all the things, like I said, they just come through your lyrics, right? When you're writing stuff like this. Um, and that's when I sat down to write the book. And it was, I mean, I don't know if you've ever written a whole book, but okay. this is my first time doing it. And yeah. it is, um, it's, it's a labor of love and commitment. And I remember yeah, every weekend because I, what I needed to as an artist in general I needed to carve out long hours of nothingness as like a the cauldron or the container of what's going to be created inside of it and within that nothingness I have the freedom to just if it takes me three hours to start something that's okay because it's serving the, the creation so I carved out these long periods and made sure that I would spend at least an hour and a half actually writing. Mm -hmm. And then once, and as with anything, once you start, then you're in it. It's breaking that moment, the little viscosity. It feels like there's viscosity there, you know, this little membrane. You break through the membrane and then you're in the bubble of creation and you're going, oh, and then you're busily writing. So I would, I, you know, I would be every Saturday and Sunday just chipping away at writing the book uh, chapter by chapter, taking it through each of the stages of alchemy that each song represented. Right. Um, and then, you know, also with, so the books, they come, you know, they have, I did also illustrated it. So it has a painting. So this is the one for beachcombing, for instance. Wow. And beachcombing is a song that's about diving into the unconscious for your relics that your, your, um, like a soul retrieval mm -hmm. is what that song is about. 
Um, and then the, the chapter gives the lyrics and then it's almost like a memoir of the, um, what, what the song, how the song is constructed, how I got inspired, musically what's going on, and then what are the hidden esoteric meanings. And then at the end of each chapter, I talk about whatever the alchemical stage is that that song represents, and then they go into a path working. And now, and I lear first learned from path workings from Dolores Ashcroft Nowicki. She was my first exposure to path workings, and I love her path workings. I've done a lot of her path workings. And so um, from having done them, I was able to create my own, you know, just from experience of having done a lot of them and love them. So I create a path working at the end of each chapter so that you can go into your own uh, experience of this stage of the chemical, alchemical mm. uh, transformation, as it were. And then I also, so then that when I when that all happened and I completed the book, which was massive and I'm so proud of it. And I think it's 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 so beautiful. Then I was like, you know what? I think I should record these path workings because that way anyone who has the book, they can put it down, put their headphones on and just experience it and be guided by my voice. So then I did that and I was working with my co-producer Fran on the underscoring music that I wanted to put under the path workings, which have themes that are related to the actual song on the album. Wow. <laughs> and we ended up making a whole hour's worth, I know. And Fran was like, you realize we just made a whole hour's worth of CD. I said, I know. It's like this, it was it just kept, you know what I mean? And I had to keep going because I didn't want to stop and truncate it. It, you know, it, that's this thing where art asks you what it wants to be. Like once you do the first chip on the stone, I'm going to make a sculpture and you chip the stone, the stone starts telling you what it's going to be. Mm. And I feel like you have to honor that. So I did. And I just, so that was the final piece of this very massive project um, between the album and then the book and then all the path working. So I really call it like a 360 immersion because you can you get all three things and you can experience them just for fun. Listen to the music. It stands on its own. But yeah. if you want to go deeper and you read the book and then go deeper still, put your headphones on. And and I've had I've heard back from some fans that we talked about that they did exper have experiences from the path working. And that is makes me so happy as a magician and as an artist and a you know, that's the goal, right? That right. that you can cause an opening in someone's soul or spirit to evolve them on their spiritual journey. That's doesn't get any better than that. It's amazing. So so from the from the first recording or, or writing, I guess, will come first before the recording, to the final word of the medita meditation pathworking C D. How, mm -hmm. how long was that? How is it must it must have been quite some journey. Yes, it was. I mean, the entire project was close to four years. Wow. Um, and with writing the songs and producing them, the book was a year and a half of that four years. So the album was pretty much complete. And then we were just doing the mixing at that point. So I knew what the songs were and I knew the order and I knew what all the themes, I knew all the esoteric hitting messages for the book. And then the recording of the path workings Obviously, once the book was done, I sat down and did the path working. So that was probably a few months of that. And then going back to Fran, and since we already had the songs written and the 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 motifs created in the music, that was relatively went pretty quickly to create the underscore music because it's long, you know, it's trans trance music. So it's very long, sustained tones with just motifs here and there. Um, so that, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, I have an a, an awe of people who write um, books. You know, um, oh. I I've I've got a very good friend, Christopher Hughes. He, uh, oh, I adore he, him. Yeah, well, you know, he's yeah. written so many books, and he just keeps writing these books. And I'm just thinking, how have you got so many words in you? <laughs> 
<laughs> because when you're around him, he has so many. He's such a witty person. Oh my yeah, gosh, yeah. wordsmith, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I don't know if it's a Geminian thing with me, but but I I I I get easily distracted, and and you know I, I, that's why I, I think I can do a five minute song, but <laughs> I mean an actual, you know. A whole book. Maybe one day I'll have a go. But you yes, know. I I yeah. recommend it. I I've never done it either, and it is absolutely. I do think it's a um a rite of passage, because once you do do it, you realize it's the Shawshank Redemption. Do you know that film, the Shawshank do, Redemption? Do, yes, one do, of yes. my favorite. It's in my top ten films because I feel like it's such a metaphor for life, mm -hmm. and the life of an artist. But it's like the Shawshank Re Redemption of life, where you realize, you know, you just every day a little bit every day and you will get there oh, it's like physical it's like being healthy too every day just make sure you do something healthy and you will be there yeah. it's a way of life it's a spiritual way of life i i believe i really do like they do say that everyone's got a book in them somewhere don't they that's the thing i <laughs> definitely believe that yes 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 and so the way this interweaves with the show I was is, just about to ask that actually. I was going to say, and you're taking it on the road, right? So, yeah. you know, so we've got a psychic thing going on, Valentina. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, the way this interweaves with the show is I, I'm just realizing there might be a theme here, but I think it has to do with the art asking for what it needs mm -hmm. because what we've ended up creating for this show, which is with myself and Rose Thorne, who is a beautiful amazingly talented singer songwriter from brighton uk is I, I can get into the genesis of how we got together but when we got together my idea was rather we're not she doesn't open for me or i don't open for her but we weave our stories and our songs together in a show and we actually have a conversation about them um and therefore, with that vision, I realized, oh, my God, I've got to write a show. Now, I have written a show before. I wrote a show here about Edith Piaf at a theater, and it was it was really cool. I can tell you about the theater if we have time. But I realized I need to now write a show. So there I am. There it is again. Like, OK, here is this thing that I want to create, and it's informing me what needs to happen for it to be created to its fullest extent. So I sat down to write what the interstitial stuff between our songs and it ends up being as if you're eavesdropping on a conversation between these two women from different age ranges cultures who are both artists and songwriters and are expressing what it's like to be alive what it's like to to be an artist or be a female you know all of the above and so slowly but surely constructed our show uh with our songs and rose thorn she was the one that laid out the order of the songs and it was absolutely brilliant because she th saw themes between them and then with those themes is how then i wove the conversation to bring out the themes of empowerment or the theme of loss or the theme of feeling alone all these different themes and so that's how this whole show evolved there and there's a magic in there too because there how could there not be because of some of the songs that are from what have i forgotten so the whole show takes you on this journey we start with my song that's called over the hedge which is named after the folk practice of traveling over the hedge and with, so it brings you over the hedge into this other world of enchantment and discovery and music and we take you through this story it's very bardic of uh, storytelling and songs through the end where you come back out from over the hedge and you're back to the mundane world again and all these things happen to you while you're inside and that's what the dreamery is it's magical music from the dreamery that's that's the show how did you meet rose how did you find her so uh one of my fans who actually discovered me from saying alexa play something ethereal and it played one of my songs. It's just switched on now. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have to be careful what you say these days. <laughs> They're listening. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> and he, he played one of my songs. And so he became a fan. He got on my email list. He bought my albums. He had a radio show. His name is Rob Perry. 
And so he interviewed me for the radio show. And then I went to England on a trip to sing in an opera and do some travels. And he said, hey, why don't we meet up? So we met up for tea. And uh, he said, you know, I'd like to, I'd love to be able to bring you to the UK for a tour. And I said, yeah, I would love that too. Let's figure out how we can make that happen. And so I came back home and I talked with Sharon Knight, mm. who was the woman who introduced you and me about, hey, let's do our evening of enchantment where we weave the same idea I had for Rose Thorne, but we, you know, Sharon will back each other up, we'll play, we'll learn each other's songs, we'll weave a show together. And um, she ultimately couldn't go. So I went back to Rob and I said, okay, Sharon can't do it, but I still would like to do this idea. And he said, I know just the person because he has a radio show. He was always getting submissions from artists all over the UK. So she had submitted her songs and he loved her material, as do I. So he invited her to a Zoom call the following week and we met and it was one of those moments when you meet someone and you immediately fall in love with them she's very spiritual very mature for her age she's very young she's 21 years old right. um but extremely grounded and really present mm -hmm. and so as we talked about this whole project and she uh, i would love to do that we'll use my band so we're using her band from brighton and then we've been meeting on zoom every week that was in september of last year cre developing the show working on the scenes you know working on the arrangements and then i came out to the uk in april of this year and we did a bunch of pre-promotional things going to all the venues and doing shout outs in front of them um and we're going to be playing here on september 20th etc cetera, etc cetera. and it was a whirlwind it was we got everything done we rehearsed with the band we shot video for promotion we shot promotional photos, you know, the whole thing. And I will, re one of the most special moments of that trip in April was, you know, I had not met her in person yet. I had met Rob in person. And then Rob brought on another partner, Simon, to help us with the tour management. And I, we hadn't met Simon in person. We'd been meeting via Zoom. So we all came together on that weekend for the first table read of the show. Now the guys knew, they understood what the show was. I explained it to them like I explained to you and the document was in a Google Drive so they could read the script, but they hadn't really experienced it. And so we did the table read where we read through the whole show and we played through all the songs. And when we finished, there was this amazing bubble of, and you know that moment like when the show ends right before people start applauding, and you know how it feels when you're the artist. You can always tell whether they liked it or whether they didn't. You know what I'm saying? You can feel it in that silence. Mm -hmm. And that it was this moment of almost awe, I would say. And it was so silent. And eventually Rose Thorne said, would somebody please say something? <laughs> and, and then both of the men were just, wow. This is, I've never heard or seen anything like this. This is incredible. Oh. I have goosebumps right now just telling the story because in that moment, I felt like all four of us realized, wow, this is something that is very special and really needs to be now squired to its fullest potential. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I feel like it's that thing. I feel, I feel like the theme for me today is just the, the realization of how, when you're striving to create that thing that you're calling forth like a child asks you gives you information what it needs to be what it wants to be like tugging on your on your sleeve and i your role is to help bring that forth as best you can even if it's not even what you thought it was going to be in the beginning you know yeah. so that's that's how that all unfolded and it's been absolutely extraordinary from start to finish very magical yeah. as a matter of fact i was doing magic around this whole idea um to manifest something at the next level and then this unfolded so i just feel like it's all so interconnected and interwoven magic and art and life yeah it's yeah. it's amazing when you you feel that i i i had 
I had a break from my Mabinogi albums. I did three, and then I just said, look, I want to write an album of songs. Mm -hmm. I finished the album of songs, and it was launched in May, the beginning of the proper, you know, height of spring. And I can't tell you, I literally must have pressed that upload to CD Baby button, and immediately it was like all the gods and heroes of the Mabinogi of the Vorth branch were hammering on the door saying, right, come on, then we're ready. Let's go. Let's go. And, and I sat down to write the story and it's a bit more of a complicated story and it just fell on the books. And like you say, sometimes it just feels like this thing really wants to be done. And you're, you're literally the conduit of it, of, of it happening and, and just providing the fingers to, to type the thing out or the, or to play the guitar or anything like that. But actually, yeah. something else going on and and I, it doesn't happen all the time but when it does happen man it is so so magical it's so magical. isn't it though and you can feel it it's like a force flowing yeah. through your body it's sometimes you can't even type fast enough no no absolutely <laughs> i can't keep up with it so you're coming over to the uk how many dates is the tour we have five dates and it opens in brighton yeah. which I'm so excited that you're going to be there. Yeah. Uh, so September 11th at the Prince Albert, which you said yeah. you've played at many times. That used uh, to be the location of our Brighton moot, like in the in the 90s, that was where the Brighton Pagan moot was held at the Prince Albert upstairs, upstairs oh. where you're going to play. So oh, yeah, oh how that. cool. Yeah, that would be like coming home. We haven't been there for years. Oh, I'm so glad you told me that. That's so yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then from there, the next show is at the Horton Arts Centre in Epsom mm -hmm. on the 20th of September. And then from there on the 25th, we are at the Wharf. Another, all of these venues are beautiful, by the way. I, I'm in awe of the beauty of these venues. The Wharf in Stourport on Severn, that's on the 25th. And then the 28th is in Litchfield at the Litchfield Guildhall. And then the final concert is the next day in Cambridge at the Cambridge Junction on the 29th, which is Sunday. Mm -hmm. And they're all in the evening. The latest one, the Prince Albert, um, the show starts at 8.45. The rest of them, the show starts at eight o'clock. And you can find tickets at nymphia.com slash tour. And it will give you all the information about the shows. So I'll have a, a link in the show notes too, so people can, uh, from the show notes, they can get directly to where to buy tickets from. Oh, thank you. In any of those towns, do come and come and join us in Brighton or anywhere else. Um, I have one last question for you. And this is a bit of a, a bit of a surprise. This one, but I just wondered what what would ha what would happen if I asked this to a musician, and and I did it. I asked myself the same question, and I said, could I answer this really quickly? And I barely made it, Valentina. So I'm. You know, <laughs> If all of the music in the world disappeared apart from three songs, what would they be? <laughs> oh, that's really tough. One of them might be White Rabbit, I'm guessing. <laughs> but you, know, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the very first thing that came into my mind was, it might surprise you because you, um, you probably haven't heard of it, but now you're going to get the choi the chance to go listen. Okay. It's called Beim Schlafengehen, and it's by Richard Strauss. And Beim Schlafengehen means going to sleep, I believe. And it's B E I M S C H L A F Schlafen E N G E H E N. Right. Maybe I should email it to you so you can search for it. Richard yeah. Strauss and Leontine Price is the vocalist, and it's Oh, I have goosebumps right now again. Um, he, Richard Strauss wrote a song cycle called The Four Last Songs right before he died, like in his 80s. And it's all about completing life and looking towards your next phase. And this one song of the cycle is so achingly beautiful. And it, it, it soars your soul and spirit up into this realm of, Wow. awe and ecstasy and it's just so that would be one i think um and god now the other two um oh my goodness I mean, that is won't great. hold you to this if this ever did happen i would say you know you have a right to change your mind at any point oh thank you okay good <laughs> Phew, the pressure is enormous um 
it pro- it might have to be uh, one of Kate Bush's songs, but then I have to narrow narrow down one of her songs. Oh my God, that's insane! This is hard. This is hard. Um, I feel like I want to get back to you on this. <laughs> okay, let me just do something really quick off the cuff. But I just uh, let's just say White Rabbit because it's brilliant. Yeah, I'm just gonna say that. And and then I'm gonna say, kind of blue um, from kind of blue. Um, so what, Miles Davis? So what? Okay, okay, right. Great songs. Yeah. Great songs. You, you, yeah. Your first one was a lot deeper than any of mine. I'm afraid. I'm. I'm oh, not... tell me what yours. Tell me yours. Well, I asked myself, and I thought, what would it be? And I and the ones that immediately came to mind, and obviously, I I reserve the right to change my mind as well at any time. As, yes. But the, but the first one would be Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. Oh, so good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it, that that guitar oh. solo halfway through. Oh, you know, Dave yes. Gilmore, Dave Gilmore can make the guitar sing to me like no other guitar player in the world. Yes, I have goosebumps again just thinking about it. The second yes. one would be, weirdly enough, Freebird by Leonard Skinner. <laughs> what? Oh, my God. Freebird. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've only got to hear those opening chords of that 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 organ what piano, are... and, I, and I'm I'm starting to well up yeah. already, you know, because I yeah. just I love that song. There's a similarity that. between those two songs, actually. Sorry, I think there's a similarity between those two songs. Yeah, they're both very long. <laughs> yeah, they're, that's good. Actually, it's smart to pick long ones because you only have three. That's true. That's true. Oh. Yes. So you could pick Anagata Davida, maybe. <laughs> That's that would do, yes, yes. And and my final one, weirdly enough, was Hell's Bells by ACDC. <laughs> oh my god. I love that song too. Yeah. So but yeah. like I say, if I sat down and properly listened to it and I asked myself the question, because I thought if if I was asked that by me, how could I how quickly could I answer? And I thought, well, yeah, I've got those three. I'd like those three. So there we go. There you go. But I'm gonna definitely look up the Strauss one when we finish, you know. So Yeah. Oh oh it's Thank you for that question. That's a tough one. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking about it all day. I might email you back. Here are my final selections. I'll okay, be- fair enough. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, Valentina. We've been talking for nearly an hour, but um, it's been really lovely to talk to you. I wish you oh. all success in the world with the uh, with the book, with the meditations, with the album, and with the tour. And um, maybe come back and tell us how it all went. You know, once Thank all- you. I love talking with you so much. Thank you for having me on. You are just a treasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Blessed be. Blessed be. Little girls that got news. Be nice as a model has been overused. I was thinking of a substitution. Be wild has got to bring the illusion. Cause you know as you stretch through the years The tall for you again And look at the canvas making art And it ain't done yet They told you to be sweet, come on kids and make them sweat They told you to be smooth, come on tight and lay your ground Make them sweat They told you to be smooth Tiger woman Tiger woman Tiger woman In this world Tiger woman No, you wanna be A tiger woman No, you've got to be A tiger woman Come on, tie the lay your ground. They told you to be sweet. Come on, kids, and make them sweat. They told you to be smooth.
What a fabulous song that was. That was Tiger Woman from Rose Thorne, the Brighton-based musician who is joining Nymphia on their UK tour. And there's a bonus, my friends. If you go to one of these shows and you walk over to the merch table and mention Druidcast, Valentina and Rose will set you up with a free download of the book and CD. That is so generous. So, my friends, support our touring artists and go and see the show if you can. Well, this music means we are approaching the end of the show, but before I go, let's have the results of last month's competition. The prize was a copy of Moss's book, An Apostate's Guide to Witchcraft, Finding Freedom Through Magic, due out in October. And the question I asked was, Moss's talk was primarily about the dragon spirits of which European country? Well, the answer was Germany, and the first name drawn from the hat and winner of that book is Scarlet Whirly Birch from Brighton, UK. Brighton is a lucky place right now. Congratulations, Scarlet. That book will be posted to you when it's published in October. The prize this month is a copy of Nymphia's book and CD set, What Have I Forgotten? And the question I'd like you to answer is... What was the song by Jefferson Airplane that inspired Nymphia on her path? What was the song by Jefferson Airplane and sung by Great Slick that inspired Nymphia on her path? Email your answer along with your full postal address to podcast at druidry.org and one of you will win a copy of that wonderful book and CD. Well, that is a show, my friends. I will see you back here next month for episode 207. But until then, I wish you all as ever peace and blessed be. Goodbye. (laughs) 